So I'm here to uh, talk to you about consciousness of Deutsch uh, Bewusstsein. What I mean with, uh, with that is that right now you should all be hearing uh, a voice inside your head. And it's a mystery how that voice gets inside your skull. Not so much, we, 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 we understand reasonably well the processes that happens when I speak, and then you have sound waves that hit your uh, ear, and then it, it activates a cochlea, and the cochlea trigger, triggers electrical impulses that go to different parts of my brain, including the auditory cortex. That's not mysterious. What is, and it's also not mysterious that in response to sounds, you may do something. You may, if I ask you to do something, you, you may do something. What is utterly mysterious is how that voice comes, because you're actually having a sensation of hearing. Or you have a sensation, you see a movie, right? The movie of your daily life. You actually see things. You not only behave visually, but you actually see things. Or you remember what you had for breakfast, or you're angry, or you're, you're conscious of your, own, um, or, um, um, of your own future death. Those are all different conscious states. And the mystery is to explain how, um, how these states come, um, come about. Because if you look at the equation, uh, foundational equations of physics, like quantum mechanics or general relativity, there's no consciousness there. If you look at the periodic table of the elements, all 92 that occur naturally, there's no consciousness there. If you look at DNA and RNA, about which we heard already a lot, there's no consciousness there. But here we find ourselves in a world where, at least sometimes during our day, and sometimes at night in the privacy of our head, when we wake up inside our sleeping body and, and experience things, we call the dreams, we have conscious experiences. And so that's been the challenge uh, to Western science and Western philosophy over the last 2,400 years of, um, um, of intellectual thought. Uh, this is the, it's also known as the, uh, the, the mind-body problem, that's the Slatzele problem. The philosopher who, in my opinion, had the, the most interesting thing to say, an insight that has not been bettered since 350 years, was the French philosopher René Descartes, who said in... Um, in, the th uh, in 1637, he wrote this Discours sur la méthode, in which he wondered what he could doubt, uh, what was certain. And the only thing he could not doubt, the only thing he could not, uh, he was absolutely certain that he existed because he was conscious. So he said, je pense donc je suis, coquito ergo somme, in, in modern language, I'm conscious and therefore I exist. The, and if you think about it, it, it is the most fundamental insight that you can have because the, the only way you know about the universe, the only way you know about your body, you know about other people and the stars and dogs and, 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 and mountains is because you have conscious sensation. It's the only thing philosophers say you have direct acquaintance with, your own conscious states. And so if science, is, uh, if science wants to have a complete picture of everything in the universe, not only the objective universe out there, but also the one inside my own skull, um, it, better ha it better arises to this challenge and explains consciousness. So I worked on this for many, many years, uh, starting last century and then till, till his death in 2004 with uh, Francis Crick, who was, uh, together with Jim Watson, of course, the person who discovered the double helical nature of, of uh, DNA that you heard uh, from Isabel so much about. And we were tired of these, we, we, we felt it was important for science in the outgoing 20th century to stop or to just get out of these interminable uh, heuristic debates with philosophers. What is consciousness? Can you define it? Does it exist? Can you ever prove it? Is it really hard or not? I mean, those are fun debates uh, you can write PhD theses about, you can have very heated debates about, but they're sterile, they don't lead to any real progress. And so we said, well, let's focus on something that we can all do uh, scientifically, and a scientific program that since then, since the last 25 years, has led to a lot of progress. Namely, let's focus on those parts of our body in general, or more specifically of our brain, that are specifically involved in any one conscious sensation. And we call those things the neuronal correlates of consciousness, often abbreviated as NCC. So what is the NCC? Well, so in this case, you have a world. You're, the world contains a German Shepherd dog, and you're looking at it. You're looking at the German Shepherd, and you have a picture of a German Shepherd in your head, right? This happens all the time. We look at something, we see, we see a picture in front of us. And so there will be some mechanisms. In this case, we've sort of schematizing some neurons that fire in a particular way. And out of, jointly, out of all these mechanisms, has to arise, it has to be like that, right? It has to arise the conscious sensation. And so now the interesting thing is, not that there is a correlate, but to, to study where is it and uh, to study its properties. So, for, for instance, which parts of the brain are really necessary for you to have conscious experience? 
For example, do you need your eyes? Well, my eyes are involved, but I can close my eyes. I can still imagine a German Shepherd. And tonight, when I go to sleep, I often dream of a German Shepherd. My first, my first uh, uh, dog that I truly loved uh, was a black German Shepherd, Nosy. And so I, I see pictures of her in, in my head without having my retina activated in the dark. So what are really the, 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 the neuronal correlates? And what is, what is common and what's different when I see my uh, germ shepherd versus when I see those roses, or when I smell roses, or when I feel sad, or when, when, you know, when I feel blue? Those are all different conscious states, and is there something common about those? Uh, all the NCCs in the same part of the brain? Do they involve the same type of neuron, maybe same set of genes, uh, uh, same neurotransmitter? Is there a particular vibration people have postulated? Is there a particular vibration associated with, 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 uh, with the conscious uh, uh, state? Those are all different possibilities uh, people have explored. Now, this is interesting, this, this line of questioning, because there are many things that do not give rise to conscious sensations. We all know this since Freud and, and, and Nietzsche, right? The, the, um, as Rolf said, the, the vast majority of our brain state we don't have conscious access to. My immune system, I, don't, I, don't, I've no, I have no experience of my immune system when it turns on and defends me against viruses or, or protozoa or other foreign agents. Even this part of the brain, so this is a brain of a, of a Chinese lady, 24, seems uh, um, uh, married, seemed that she has a slight uh, a speech impediment and she has some motor dysfunctions, but otherwise she talks, she has a normal range of hu uh, human exposures. She had to get a brain scan and then turns out she has a big hole in the back of her head. This is a location where in all of us you have a brain called the cerebellum. It's Kleinhirn, the little, uh, the little brain. And in fact, ironically, uh, it's called the Kleinhirn because it contains, in fact, the majority of all the neurons. 80% of all your neurons form part of the cerebellum. So what this patient shows clearly that uh, so she, she's a rare case of somebody who was born without a cerebellum. She never had one. Um, but what, what this shows is that the cerebellum, although it seems a neuron, a part of the brain like other parts, it has neurons, they have, they're very elaborate, they have electrical activity and synapses, that not all parts of the brain seem to be involved in, in generating consciousness. Because if you lose the cerebellum, your consciousness isn't impaired. So, so what is it about the, the, the special part of the brain? And what, what is special about those special parts of the brain? And can we rip, you know... Whatever that special property is, can we replicate it in computers? Or, for example, can we get these guys to ever show this property? Because right now, I believe, or most of us believe, if I turn my iPhone on, it doesn't feel like anything. It can take pictures, but I don't believe it actually has an inner picture, an inner picture like I have. It can record voices, right? But I don't think actually it hears inside its silicon case. So why is that not? And is it in principle possible that we can build things that will experience things? Uh, so, um, this is a, an image from a brain scan done by a, a colleague of mine, um, uh, uh, Jean Dieu and Stan de Hain. It shows one of many experiments that he and, 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 and my own lab and many other people have done that indicate some of the parts of the brain that, are, that we believe are necessary, that mediate the content of consciousness. And they tend to be associated with, these, with the cerebral cortex. In fact, not, all, no, not the entire cortex. So the cortex is the, the part of the brain uh, on the top of the brain. It sort of constitutes uh, maybe 80% uh, by volume, 16 billion neurons out of the 86 billion neurons that we have. And some parts of that brain seem to be involved in generating consciousness, whether it's hearing or smelling or remembering or seeing color. Different parts of the brain seem to be associated with generating di di um, different aspects of consciousness. Now, the trouble with fMRI, with, with functional brain imaging, it's a very cool technology, but from a, scientific, from a neuroscientific point of view, it's very crude. It's like, look, it's, like, um, it's like looking for your keys from an airplane that flies 50,000 feet above, uh, above the Kaufleuten. Not very useful if you lost your keys somewhere late at night. And so what we need, we need, uh, we need techniques and tools that zoom in to the relevant level. And the relevant level, uh, you heard them already, they were mentioned today, are nerve cells. Uh, there are a lot of them. As I said, there are 16 billions of them. Here you can see some that are stained with a particular fluorescent dye. So this is a little, tiny little bit of, of, of cortex, a very, very small part of cortex. And you can see, just like a forest, it has all this vertical organization. Those are the, the, the dendrites and the axons of, of those neurons. And there are a lot of them. I brought, I learned from Raffaello the importance of having things to show to people. So here, I saved a little crumb. I got a little crumb from the, 
the Brötchen that we had. And if I assume this is one by one by one millimeter, one cubic mil millimeter, then this crumb of bread, of brain matter, if it's brain matter, would contain roughly 100,000 cells and order a billion synapses, eine milliarde, and roughly two kilometers of wiring, which is pretty impressive. And by the way, whether it's a human brain or monkey brain or mouse brain, it's pretty much the same. There are lots and lots of small differences, but there really isn't any essential difference. The main difference between a mouse brain and a human brain is the size. We are a thousand times bigger. But of course, there are, other, there are other animals, like elephants and blue whales, that have even bigger brains. And so we really, if we want to understand consciousness or behavior or the pathologies of consciousness, such as schizophrenia, we really need to understand uh, neurons. It is neurons that are the atoms of perception. All right, so that brings me to uh, the, the place where, uh, for which I left academia. It was started by, by this gentleman, Paul Allen, who, of course, in 81, together with Bill Gates, started, um, started Microsoft. So Paul has an immense interest and curiosity about the world, and he doubted a number of institutes that, uh, that study. These are basic science in institutes. Um, and among others, he started us in, in uh, Seattle in, 2000, um, in 2002, in the Pacific Northwest. So what are we? We are uh, an institute. We're going to move into a big building that he also gave us, uh, next to the Amazon headquarters, in fact, just one, one street away. And right now, we are roughly 300 people, moving up to 500 people. And I'm the, the, the chief scientific officer of them. And uh, we are about big, big science and team science and open science. So unlike a university, we focus on a few very large-scale projects that requires the expertise of many, many different um, domains of science and engineering. So that's why we have large teams. And we need to work very, very closely together, a little bit like, like CERN um, in, in, um, in, um, in Geneva. And so we do everything as a team. We do a few large projects in sort of biotech, um, in a biotech manner, and we do open science. So everything we do, once it passes quality control, we put out there on our website. So there's no, uh, you can right now uh, go to our website, you can download every, all the atlases, there's no login, there's no IP, there's nothing there, it's all for free, available to anybody, including viewers. And so we made a number of fundamental discoveries. This is, for example, one atlas we made of the human, of the human brain, where we analyzed in six neurotypical brains, uh, using thousand, for each brain, 1,000 microarray chips, we analyzed at a very um, detailed scale all the different genes that are expressed by, uh, th uh, throughout the different parts of the brain, and thereby to identify certain really remarkable difference between cortex and cerebellum on the one hand and all the other parts of the brain on the, on the other hand. This is another large-scale atlas that we published this year which is uh, in several thousand mice, up to 3,000 mice, we uh, have a very high-resolution atlas of individual long-range axons where they project to it. So it's really the wiring diagram. You know, if you're interested, let's say, in the visual cortex and you want to know to which other areas does the visual cortex project, you can go into this atlas and, and get all the information at, at, high, high, uh, at high resolution. And typically, a project like this will involve, you know, 100 people and, and 25 million, so it's difficult to do at the, at the, um, um, at the university. We've now uh, started several years, two years ago when I came, I, we presented to Paul a 10-year plan, a 10-year vision uh, that we are now executing for roughly a billion dollars and for, as I said, 500 people that we are now um, engaged in, that, 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 that he has funded. So one of the things we're doing, we're working in the, both in the mouse brain, you heard from Isabella already, it has a lot of similarities with the human brain, and also in the, in the human brain. So here, for example, we're doing this innovative stuff where we, record, where we take neurosurgical samples. In this case, you have a patient. He has a um, dysfunctional hippocampus. That's the area of the brain where the yellow arrow points to. The surgeon has to take that out to prevent epileptic seizures from originating from that place. In order to get to that place, he has to cut a, a tunnel to access that place. And so he takes out a little part of the brain that's typically discarded as medical waste. We wait just outside the OR with a special um, cool device. The surgeon puts these little pieces uh, of brain matter in there, and then we go to our institute and study them now. Um, uh, we can keep them alive for a day or two. And you've got to remember, this is a piece of brain that came from an intact brain 20 minutes ago that may contain you know, the memory of the first kiss of this person. So it's a real living brain. And we can now probe it with all the techniques that usually we can only use in, an in animals to understand where's the similarity and where's the difference, in particular all the different cell types, because we now know there's not only excitatory and inhibitory cells. If you look in brain cell as a class, there are probably a thousand possibly even more different cell types. And the secret of, of, um, 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 of our behavior, including consciousness, arises out of the complexity of all those things. So we need to, uh, we need to study them at high resolution. 
And one of the things that we're doing, this is right now we're doing in, in, in mice, but we're also moving to that to human, where we try to get from the same cell, we try to identify the way the neurons behave. Here you can see action, electrical activity, the way uh, they, they fire these little action, these, uh, these impulses, which is a universal currency, which which all brain uh, and neurons um, communicate to each other. We'd like to reconstruct their morphology, the, 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 the dendrite, the input end and the output end. This is a, a beautiful uh, cell reconstructed here, in fact, at the ETH by, uh, by Kevin Martin and his team. Then we also like to analyze the, the molecules that are expressed by doing RNA-seq. So we look at you know, a, a eight to 10,000 RNA species that are expressed in that one cell, and we also computer model that cell. So now we have a high resolution view of, of this one cell where we look at how does it look, where does it project to, what's its electrical behavior, what are the genes expressed, and we do that in thousands of cells, both in a mouse and in, in people. And then we can begin to look at taxonomy. We can see what are the different types of neurons and how do they connect, and do they have, we know already, we, we know already enough to know that there's specific connection rules, very sp there's enormous amount of complexity. The brain for its size is by far the most complex organ in the known universe. And that is important because f for my mind, so I study consciousness since 25 years, the only real, uh, the most compelling theory of consciousness is um, a body of knowledge known as integrated, inf uh, um, integrated information theory of consciousness by the Italian-born um, psychiatrist, neuroscientist Giulio Tononi. And he essentially argues that any piece of highly organized matter uh, is associated that the that highly organized pieces of matter have as a property are conscious. We just live in a universe where highly organized pieces of matter that have a particular type of organization, maybe namely the one that maximizes integrated information, which you can write down as a well-developed mathematical expression. So any piece of tissue that has integrated information will explain something. We just live in a universe where that is the case. It's just like there's space and time and matter and energy, and there's also consciousness. It's part of the, the, it's part of the basic fiber of... Um, of um, of the universe. And this theory, for example, will explain why, why the cerebellum does not give rise to consciousness, but why, co why cortex does. It also explains why in deep sleep you don't have conscious experience and why an epileptic seizure, when your brain is entirely hypersynchronized, uh, hyper is, uh, is not conscious. It, it also begins to explain at what point in development, when, when, when is, is your fetus conscious, is your newborn conscious, when does consciousness arise for, um, and for the different senses. It begins to address a very difficult clinical uh, question by building a conscious meter that tells us if we have a particular individual in front of us who's severely damaged due to an accident or intoxication, is this person actually conscious or just uh, but alive but unconscious? And it also addresses the question where does consciousness arise uh, across different animals? And ultimately, it also addresses the question very specifically to what extent can computers ever be conscious and things like uh, is, the internet, uh, is the internet conscious? So so thereby, by doing a combination of, of experiments, detailed experiments to try to study the complexity of, of the brain, our brain and um, brain of related species, together with, with theoretical um, and consideration, we, we hope to, to, to finally solve in my lifetime, because it is my burning passion, as it's always been since I first studied philosophy in, in Tübingen many, many years ago, I want to understand, before I die, how the water of the brain gives rise to the wine of my conscious experience. Thank you very much.